Our next speaker is Neo Martinez from the University of Arizona, and he will be talking about complexity in ecological networks from barriers to opportunities. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to be here and part of this institute. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to um, coming uh, to Mexico and talking about my work. Uh, my, actually, my, uh, though my name, <laughs> despite my name, I do not speak uh, Spanish very much at all, though my grandmother only spoke Spanish. She was from Durango. And so, alas, I'm back, <laughs> at least uh, in a way. Um, and um, I'm talking about ecological networks. It's quite a different scale from the previous talk. We were, uh, when... Uh, no, we just like to know if we can transmit life. Oh, yes. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And um, let's see. Okay, so um, this is quite a different scale from what we just heard, but it's very similar. We're talking about eating. The, this ecological network represents species eating other species. We have plants at the bottom of this food web. Um, uh, uh, let's see, herbivores above. You have arm, omnivores that eat the herbivores and plants. And basically what we're seeing is uh, the population fluctuations that are due to these feeding interactions. The plants at the bottom of the network either, uh, let's see, grow when they're not eating, being eaten that much, and they shrink when they're being eaten a lot. And so here we have the emergent linear dynamics of a high dimensional network. And so this is feeding scaled up to a whole food web. And I'm going to be talking about that. So um, what this work describes is how we scale up interactions between species using networks to understand whole systems, the whole uh, whole ecosystems. And that's been the um, focus of my career. Um, let's see, there's another. There we go. And the food webs have been a uh, focus of information, uh, a focus of interest for a long time. This is uh, hundreds of years old. This is a wonderful uh, and, and powerful uh, art piece describing how big things eat small things, and it's very political. It talks about how the greater, uh, the greater entities, the greater people in the world feed on the smaller ones. This, uh, if this person's explaining it to his kid, and the kid says, yeah, I've seen it before. I see like this, it, we see it all the time. And it's sort of a very moral tale about who eats whom. The big ones eat the little ones. That back in about 1990, we have some more ecological work a couple hundred years later um, about how tangled these networks are. And when Kirk Weinmiller went ahead and spent a long time in, I believe, Colombia documenting food webs, he found out that it's kind of a tangled mess that I think his diagram illustrates quite well. And he was quite a strong critic of food web theory that tried to do science with this sort of thing. Peter Yodzis, later on in 2000, started do, uh, worked on this um, Benguela web in South, in South um, um, sorry, uh, South Africa, off the coast of South Africa, and he was interested to see if that if we got rid of the seals that are somewhere in this sort of blurry uh, uh, diagram, if you got rid of seals, would you increase the availability of fish to the um, fishing industry? And what he found out is that not really. If we, it, using the math at the time, if you, ta if you take out a node such as the seals, you couldn't even predict the direction of the change on its prey because there's so many other interactions within this network. All sorts of other things could dominate the effect of removing the seals not uh, on the seal's prey. So we have this range of previous uh, ideas about ecological networks from being immoral to being intractable 
and from to being indeterminate. So this is a problem. This was the barrier that um, we had going into this work. Uh, I think you know, where we came to is, hey, wait a minute. I think they're beautiful, they're, attra they're tractable, and they're scientifically productive uh, to study, and I think rather simple. So that's the journey that I hope to take you on during this presentation. This is a web of Little Rock Lake, Wisconsin. I put it together as a master's student back, uh, back at the University of um, Wisconsin. We, we have a bunch of phytoplankton and algae at the base of it. We have zooplankton feeding on them. We have a bunch of insects, uh, uh, larvae eating within this network. And we have uh, uh, fishes at the top of the web. These uh, nose ring looking uh, uh, um, links are conveniently cannibalism. That's a species eating itself. It eats, as, it eats a leech, the leech eats it. So these are the networks that I'm going to be showing quite a bit of. Um, the range of complexity of these networks go from a connectance of 3 to 30 percent. Now, connectance is just the fraction of all possible links that are realized. If everything eats everything, every species eats every species within this network, including its cannibalistic self, you have a number of links equal to the square of the species, and you have a connectance of one. What we see in empiric empirically is it ranges from around 3 percent to 30 percent. So that gives you an idea of the webbiness of the networks we're looking at. We have a whole range of different, um, let's see, empirical webs. Uh, these low connectance webs where you have a, a species, about 61 species, 3% uh, connectance. These are some of the uh, higher connected webs. We go up to, up to like a Coachella Valley, a ve desert web um, with a connectance of 31% and a number of species, 29%. So that gives you a range of what we see out there in nature. Uh, here's some newer ones. These are some more highly connected, um, let's see, uh, marine food webs. And what we've gone, let's see, I'm just, Another slide there. Um, okay, and so what we have is a bunch of food webs that um, look quite different from one another. It's apparently quite complex. We have a bunch of different networks, and what we'd like to do is find something that connects them, makes them uh, more scientifically tractable. I already gave you one uh, uh, comment that helps us get there, this idea that uh, that connectance is within a small, well, a somewhat restricted range. And um, is there anything else that holds these things together? One thing is that the distrib distribution of generality and specialization among these webs are quite sim similar. These are these cumulative distribution graphs that are very um, a popular, a popular way for telling how many species you have that have many links and how that decreases, how that um, fraction, that cumulative distribution decreases as you restrict your uh, observations to less and less connected nodes. And so the, what this shows is that the distribution of a whole bunch of different webs, I think there's about 16 webs on this graph, is quite similar. So generalists and specialists, we have a, basically you have a lot of specialists and not many generalists in these webs. And it's much more mathematically uh, defined than that. And so that's one, those are more statistical similarities amongst these networks. What I'm going to talk about now is a more um, mechanistic similarity. And the mechanism that we've um, described, well, the mechanisms that we think are responsible for these structures are described in this model that Rich Williams and I created called the niche model. And what it hypothesizes is that there's this hierarchy that we just call a community niche space between zero and one. So things higher on the hierarchy tend to eat things lower on the hierarchy. And so 
the, the, what we ha have that hierarchy represents what we well know, you know, food chains, that there's plants at the bottom, you have herbivores and carnivores. So that's part of it. Big things eating little things is another part of this hierarchy. And then there's this contiguous, well, we have is about six species represented on this community niche axis. And we assert also not only that there's a hierarchy, things eat lower on that hierarchy, but when they eat, they have, they eat a contiguous uh, section of this hierarchy. You can eat, if you eat big things and medium uh, and little things, then you also eat medium-sized things. You can't just pick and choose different species on this uh, axis at will. So the other, now the last thing we hypothesize as responsible for what we see among, about who eats who in nature is this idea that the variation that we see from say a forest to a marine system to a lake, is basically due to the diversity, the number of species that we see in those systems. So if you give me the number of species and the number of links or connectants of a network, this model will create a food web that looks like the one we see in nature. And so these are the way, this is the formal way that we get there. First of all, we take each one of these S species and we give them a uniformly random number between zero and one. And that places the S species on this axis. Then we give the, each one of those species a feeding range. And that's a feeding range, an R sub I, between 0 and 1. And it comes from a beta distribution with a mean of 2 times connectance that we just multiply times the niche value of the organism that, um, that owns that range. And so if you have a number that is between 0 and 1, its average is two times connectance, and then we, met, we multiply it times the niche value of the organism, the average of uh, numbers between zero and one is 0.5, you get um, a bunch of ranges, uh, I'm sorry, you get a, net, well, a bunch of ranges whose mean is equal to connectance. And the network that you generate has the number of links that matches the number of links in the empirical web. So those are the two input, that's how those two input parameters are used. Now, now what we have to do, the last step in this model, every species has a niche value, it has a range, we just have to pre place that niche range on the, um, on the axis to figure out what this, and this i species eats. And we just do that by choosing a center of this range that's in between half of the range and, um, and the niche value of the organism. You do it, uh, and then you place the range on this axis. You, choose, you make it the center, the, the minimum of R, divide R sub I over two, so it doesn't fall off the axis. And you make it the maximum of just below N sub I, so basically, so you maintain that hierarchy. Things tend to eat things lower than itself. Yes? Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, in, 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 the, in the previous slide, slide you talked about uh, diversity and complexity. Uh, what do you mean by complexity here? Here, connectance. Just connectance? Yep. And the other one is that, uh, I don't know if I missed it, why did you choose a better function and not some other distribution? It was about the simplest function we could come up with that um, that got us and uh, uh, that did the work of generating. A better function is very flexible. It can do many yeah, things. Yeah, it is. So it's a way that you could choose parameters to do what you wanted it to do? Yeah, some, some kind of? yep. it was okay. the simplest way of doing the job. Okay. Yeah, it's a bunch of work where people use exponential functions yeah. and other sorts of things. But it's but the flexibility of the better function that's what you yeah. took advantage of. Yeah, okay. and other people have done versions of the niche model with an exponential function that does pretty, pretty a bit, a little bit worse. And this is an interesting little detail. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have this niche model. 
You give it the number of species, the amount of complexity in terms of connectance, and it creates networks. Here's an observed network of the Mar St. Martin Island. Here's two networks generated by the niche model. We can, of course, run it over and over again. It has stochastic components. Here's a Skipworth uh, Pond network. It has 25 species, 32% connectance. Here's a, a version of what the niche model created. Here's the Ethan Estuary web. This is what we, this is the data. Here's four instances, ran the niche model four times, and this is what we got. And so, um, let's see. So this gives us an idea of, you know, you can say, does the niche model work? And you can say, oh, you know, uh, it, it, to me, it looks pretty good considering the range of networks, but of course we have a bunch of statistics that quantify the goodness of fit. Um, we've, um, we, I'm not going to go through it all, I'm just going to generalize about, you know, we have 19 webs uh, in one paper, we used, looked at 16 network properties, things, classic network properties like uh, average path length, other more food web uh, properties like average food chain length, fraction of species at different trophic levels, that's what's among all these network properties. Um, we get the degree distribution right, the, the balance, the, how many are specialists and generalists it does pretty well. There's um, an issue about intervality, that idea of contiguity is a very strict criteria in the model. If you look at the data, it's to make the data fit that. And there's been a lot of work on dealing with contiguity and trying to um, relax that contiguity assumption. Um, in any case, when you do that, you get, it sort of does the model gets a little bit better and a little bit worse. The one thing I will tell you a bit more about is this wonder, to me, a wonderfully exciting part of what the niche model has been able to do, and that is predict the structure of half billion year old paleo webs. Um, and so that that's these webs from two, um, uh, two uh, fossil formations, the Jer Burgess Shale, very famous one, and the Cheng Cheng Shale. And this is back a half billion years ago, just when multicellular life really got going during the Cambrian explosion, we had these like meter long um, uh, anomalous keras that ate these things like trilobites. This one, my, one of my favorites, Hallucinogenia, as they had uh, different fossils that they found of this organism. They had, a, I think, a decades-long argument about what it looked like. But as more and more fossils became uh, apparent, they were able to settle on something that looks just like this. You have these five-eyed invertebrates, crazy Dr. Seuss-looking critters. But the, um, the paleobiologists, namely Doug Irwin and Rachel Wood, They've spent their lives studying these things, figuring out they have fossilized gut contents, a lot of soft if, tissue uh, preservation in these fossil formations. Um, we have um, fossilized poop that they look at. They have been worked a long time to assemble these food webs of these uh, um, of these systems. And if you and once they got, gave us the empirical data, we would just take the number of species and the amount of connectance, feed it to our niche model, and pretty much come up with the same, a, a very similar web. We, here's a bunch of those properties that I mentioned, the number, the fraction of species that are top, intermediate basal species, the fraction of species that are herbivores, cannibals, omnivores, blah, 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 the number of chains, the variability, the standard deviation of the chain length, uh, these classic ones, path length, clustering coefficients. Here's the observed values. Here's the mean values of those things from the niche model. And here's basically plus or minus um, uh, let's see, uh, an error term. Um, the idea is that we run the model a thousand times with that same input. It gives us a range of every one of these properties. This is the mean. This measures how close to the mean it was. It shows these ones are the biggest differences. Basically, um, let's see, the species in these webs were more vulnerable. They tended 
to get eaten by more species than t is typical in the niche model. And there's a couple of other things. I think the big point is that there are many more similarities to, um, to modern webs. Here, I'll show you that, than there are differences. Let me show that in a different form. This is that bullseye of plus or minus one model error. Ninety-five percent of all those statistics are within that range within the niche model. Here's a bunch of those niche, uh, modern webs. You can find out that you ideally 95 percent of those observations would be within that bullseye. It's actually only about, um, let's say, 85 percent. So it's not it's not perfect, but um, there's the Cambrian webs. There's a few more in, um, observations outside of that bullseye, but in, gen in general, I would say the old webs look a lot like the new webs in, ter in terms of being measured by this niche model. That's the big conclusion. So the idea is you've got this, um, you've got DNA, you've got protein, you know, there's only so many ways you can eat and be eaten, and it's been quite consistent for a half billion years. So there's a question over there, yeah? Yeah, how do the uh, networks depend on the actual geographic area you're looking at? I mean, this thing with the relationship between generalists and specialists, something can look like a specialist on one scale and a generalist on another uh, scale. I mean, if you look at a, a high-level carnivore like a lynx, you know, you look at a certain restricted range, it might just be eating a, a couple of types of rabbit, but if you look over its extended range, there could be many, many there. Yes, um, that's a wonderful question. Early in my career, I, there, there's another issue. Criteria for link, a linkage. If I include a link, if, I call it the bug in the jogger's tooth problem. If you're running down the street and get a bug in your mouth, does that mean humans eat you know, uh, the, the fly? I think there's a bunch of issues about scale that is key here. Um, basically, we take the data. It, 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 what they tell us. If they tell us what they tell us, the field experts say this eats that. It goes into the food web, and that's our data. Um, the scale we usually norm normalize these um, networks such that a generalist eats. Say, if you're in a 15% connected food web, a generalist eats more than 15% of the species in the network. A specialist eats fewer than 15% of the species in the network. So that's how we do it. There's some problems with that. We've gone into it, but hopefully that helps you a little bit. Okay, so what we went from here in, empirically is from back, um, Summer Hayes and Elton did this Bear Island food web back in 1923. Uh, I put together this Little Rock Lake food web in 1991, and here's a Benguela, uh, no, um, an Arctic food web. Oh, darn, I'm forgetting the name of it. But this is the newest sorts of webs that mean up with many more species and much better data to get, some, I think, get at some of the issues that um, the, the empirical issues that we have with these networks. So that gives you, um, we're really, most of the theory is done at this level. Um, we're only getting to this level now that we have data available. So that's all about structure. Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna, though, what I want to get to, well, let me conclude the structural part of the talk. And that is, I think these networks are simpler than we thought. I think they're consistent, namely, if we look at the different habitats and we look at different spatial extents and we look at different times, we, get, we see very similar structures. And so what can we use them for? And I think what we really want to use them for is for dynamics. How do the architecture of these networks affect their dynamics? Or in, in ecology, we want to say, how does community ecology, an ecology focused on species interactions, affect population biology, uh, and a, a, a subdiscipline of ecology looking at the fluctuations of populations, and also ecosystem ecology that looks at the fluctuations of ener energy and material amongst in these systems. So this is the, this is the main use case that I want to look at. That is, how does the structure affect the dynamics that we saw in, that, in my opening slide. 
So we have some equations that have been developed in the um, in ecology to deal with population dynamics. You might recognize some of these um, these equations. We've got a model we call the Elemetric um, Trophic Network Model that's based on a bunch of different um, papers that we've published. And I'm just showing those these to you, but I'm going to get to the equations. And that is, we model the change of each species biomass over time as, a, 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 as, this, fun, as this function here, this equation right here. So uh, plants, they can grow. They just grow as a, with a production rate, uh, a logistic uh, production that I'll talk about. Animals, they, they lose energy. They die, basically, as a um, function of their mass-specific metabolic rate times their biomass. We all need energy to stay alive. That's what this term ca captures. Then animals can eat. They get what they, they sum up. We sum up everything they get from eating and they lose everything they lose from being eaten. So that's the equation. You've got uh, plants can grow. This is zero for, um, uh, for uh, animals. And then, but uh, plants also get eaten. Animals, they have a metabolic loss. They uh, eat and are eaten. That's the model. I'll go. I'll start explaining that by focusing on plants that grow and are eaten. These are just these terms are zero. So we use a community level uh, carrying capacity. That um, the cl the closer the community of plants gets to this carrying capacity, their growth goes to zero. And so they have a, each species has an intrinsic growth rate times the biomass that's growing and then corrected by how close they are. That's just a classic logistic growth equation applied to a community of plants. Now animals, they have that mass specific, mass specific metabolic rate, as I mentioned. And then they have this A term here, which is kind of key that deals with eating and being eaten. One of the things I love about this term, you have the mass specific me metabolic rate times the biomass of the species in the system. Basically, that is life force. That's the energy of we're, what we're doing. That's not who we are. That's what we're doing. That's how much energy. We're like a 100 watt light bulb or something like that. We're talking about 100 watts there. And so um, you multiply this force of every species times their maximum assimilation rate, namely how much can they eat for a given amount of force. Uh, it's typically around five or seven, namely on over a long term, we can eat five times more than we metabolize at, at, over a unit of time. And then we have this key functional response here. The functional response is kind of the mad model that gives us a lot of the nonlinear behavior. The functional response measures what fraction of the total consumption a species achieves, achieves as a function of the abundance of its prey and some other things. Namely, if there's no prey around, if there's nothing to eat, you better not be eating. If you're totally stuffed and you have an infinite amount of food, then you are limited only in basically your digestive system and how quickly you can eat. If you double, it, double the density of food again, you're not going to eat any faster. So we have this asymptote that this functional response goes to between eating nothing and eating as much as you can. There's this fancy function here that tells you how quickly you can eat. Um, we, we include predator interference, so if the predator is fighting with itself, say wolves, they, as they get more dense, the, if, if, they, if they have a lot of predator interference, then for the same density of food, this red line shows that you achieve a lower consumption rate. So there's a lot of ecology here, whether you chill out when a species is, when your prey is rare and you make up for it when it's abundant, uh, whether you have hidey holes, where the prey has hidey holes, there's a bunch of stuff that's included in this uh, functional response. But basically, it's how you go from zero to maximum consumption rate.
And there's a bunch of theory about that. That if you want to ask questions, please do. I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna point out that. One of the miraculous parts of this model is the ability to parameterize it. The, and it's based on the metabolic theory of ecology, where we can look at meta, how well metabolic rate is predicted by a very easily measurable aspect of an organism. How much does it weigh? What is its body mass? Tell me what its body mass is of you know anything from, from uh, invertebrates to endotherms, fish, and fruit. We can get that X sub I pretty accurately. For plants, we can uh, we can we can look at its body mass and figure out its uh, maximum growth rate. So we can basically look at who eats whom, how big these critters are, and do pretty much all of the parameterization of this model. That's sweet. <laughs> I think that makes things a lot easier. Um, this is basically what I've told you is a. Uh, it's based on the Rosenzweig and MacArthur model, turned, which was a, a birth and death model turned into a biomass model that we generalized to n uh, species. And then we've done what I'm going to talk about a little bit is where we've added detritus and some other components, and we've applied it to, uh, to model a lake and we've applied it to fisheries. I won't talk about pollination networks, but that's what we're doing now. We're adding mutualism to this network. So that gives you the big view of what the governing model of, uh, of these networks are that we use. I'm going to talk about some of the applications now. One of the, my favorites is um, when we are working with Eric Berlow, who with his PhD, he removed this predator, uh, predaceous whelk from these intertidal systems. These predaceous whelks ate uh, mussels and barnacles. And one of the holy grails of food web theory is can you predict the effect of removing a species out, uh, out of a system on the organisms that are remain in the system? And so that looks like this. Here we have a uh, uh, the the network. I'm going to wait until this species, this kind of, it's almost like a parasite. It's a specialist on a omnivore, and I'm going to remove it. And so if you think about the average abundance of this network before with that species present, and you compare it to the average abundance of that, uh, of these species with that, that species absent, you basically calculate the interaction, I'm sorry, yeah, the, uh, interaction strength. If, if the averages are exactly the same, it didn't make any difference to remove that species, then the interaction the strength is very, very low. If, it has a, if that removal has a big effect, the mean densities before and after removal are very different, then you get a, a large interaction strength. And so to predict that effect has been a holy grail of ecological theory for a long time, been addressed many times in experiments like this one. And so um, Eric did that, and what we wanted to do is to see if our model can predict what he saw in the field. And what we would do is we take these elementric trophic network models, what you just saw there in the, in the more dynamic screen, we parameterize them according to empirically reasonable uh, body size ratios. Uh, predators are often about 10 or 100 times bigger than their prey. Huge variability. You have some that are parasites that are like 100 times or 1,000 times smaller than their prey. You have things like uh, filter feeding whales that are six orders of magnitude or seven orders of magnitude sometimes bigger than their prey. There's a big variability, but there's a strong central tendency. We parameterize those models with these tendencies and then remove a species and look at the effect in the computer of that removal. And we use statistics to try and predict the effect in the computer. And what we found is that, um, okay, what we, find, what we find is that um, we can predict the effect in the computer based on the abundance of the prey that's in the system and the body size in abundance of the predator. Given those three parameters, 
we do a pretty good job of uh, predict, predicting the effect in the computer. Does that apply to the field? This small intertidal hub habitat with uh, uh, about 30 species, where you have uh, predatory whelk, the removed species, we have a target species that we're going to measure the effect on, the mussels, and what we do is that we measure the interaction strength of the whelks on the mussels. And so this is the right here, the solid lines and the, da the data points represent what was observed in the field. This is uh, uh, ordinated such that the muscle, the abundance of the prey is there, and the uh, and we're parameterizing it for two different abundances of the removed species. Sometimes that whelk was very abundant. Sometimes that whelk is very rare. That was the field. That was the field system. Do you actually measure the interaction or the correlation? We use the interaction. So directly. I mean, it directly. And then it, as far as the computer system, and what we, uh, we, the in silico experiments, we measure the statistics, which might be called the correlations. And we use that correlation in the computer to predict what we see in the field. And so what we found is that the predicted, these dotted lines overlap almost too well with the data. We successfully predicted it. Uh, Rich and uh, um, the chair of the UC Berkeley Statistics Department worked on, uh, worked on this data for another half year to make sure it wasn't just a spurious correlation. So you see something like this type of match between theory and data, and it sort of feels like someone's rigged something. It wasn't rigged. Um, this was a really good match. One thing I should measure is in, mention is that in the presence of the mus, uh, the I'm sorry, the barnacles, there's this uh, mutualistic interaction where the barnacles form a very good substrate for the mussels. They can at rock and grow much better with barnacles around than with barnacles absence. In the systems with barnacle presence, we didn't predict so well. And so that's what motive that's one of the several things that motivated us to start including mutualistic or facilitative interactions are a model. But when that wasn't there, we did pretty well. So now we're going to another application, this uh, beautiful lake in Lake in the Central Europe at the base of the Alps at the intersection of Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, where the Germans have been uh, uh, observing this lake for 30 years. Every two weeks, or uh, um, and sometimes in every one week during the growing season, they go out in this lake to several stations and they measure the abundance of 25 different components of the food web. Um, they have this huge, uh, I'm sorry, 24 species. They have a bunch of the, the bacteria, some uh, other, the cyanobacteria, a bunch of different algae, a bunch of rotifers, some ciliates, some heterotrophic nanoflagellates, some crustaceans, and four uh, and some fishes, some young fishes and some old fishes. And they get the data and create a time series, a 30-year long time series on that data. Great place for us to test the model. Here's the network. We know the body sizes. Can our model predict the seasonal dynamics of this web? Here's the relative abundance over those 30 years. It shows that there's a lot of crustaceans. Some, there's these rare ciliates, but they're highly active. They eat a lot. They're very small and highly active. But this gives you an idea of the relative abundance over those 30 years. But that's not what we were interested in. We're much more interested in the seasonal dynamics. And if you study tempor temporal lakes, it's almost like uh, you know leaves uh, emerge in the spring and they go to the ground in the fall. And lakes, the way that looks like, is in the spring, these bunch of species of algae become much more abundant. Then the herbivores become quite abundant and they chow down the algae and, uh, but then their, their uh, 
carnivores become abundant also. So the herbivores are hammered between starving and very active predators, so they get reduced. The algae return after this period in midsummer called, um, uh, called uh, the clear water phase. And so this is just, out of all of those 30 years, we sort of created an average year, something that we thought would be driven primarily by trophic dynamics and would be free of the year-to-year -year variability of weather for, uh, uh, that we weren't including so much in this model. So this was the target uh, that we wanted to get. Um, we fed the model with these, um, uh, with the initial biomass in the spring and the X sub i's and R sub i's as estimated from the body sizes of the organisms. The way we, what we did with the data is we chose, if, if we have these different phases what we took is the average abundance of each of those phases and graphed them here in terms of relative biomass. This one is those rare rotifers and ciliates. That's that little section blown up to be much more visible. Here's the model results. You can look at them. It's about a similarity, about 0.82, between the average abundances of each of these phases between the observed in the predicted from the model. You can see that we, the model says there's more rotifers than the empirical data, fewer ciliates, but that's that tiny bit of biomass in there. What I'd say is that's a pretty good fit. We did pretty well in predicting the, the seasonal, this classic ecological phenomenon in temperate lakes with our model. And so what we, it, this opens the door to forecasting. Uh, we can, uh, sort of like weather forecasting, give me the data now, how far in the future can you predict the abundance of these organisms? Um, and we can see that, well, given the weather, there, we're going to have to deal with uh, some uh, other parameters, such as a drought this year, is it wet this year? But this provides a framework onto which we can start doing that sort of work. What I want to get to, though, is my last part is about feeding. And um, let's see, this fishing um, is known to destabilize fish populations. Not only does fishing decrease the abundance of the fishes, it increases their variability over time. Um, and many times when you say, hey, you're, you're fishing too much, when people stop fishing, the fish don't recover. It's like, wait a minute. I thought we, cra we killed them, why don't they come back when we stop killing them? The other big effect that's been uh, seen is that it's a hugely strong selective force for smaller and earlier reproducing organisms. If you want to escape the net, don't grow so fast, and if you want to, and you better have your kids quick, because if you don't, you probably aren't going to last very long in this new environment where fishing boats are all over the place. So those are a huge uh, uh, effects on the fisheries. We wanted to address those with our models to see what happens. Well, can we explain this failure? Can we explain this destabilization? And what is the effect of this selection? So we d took the uh, Lake Constance food web that I just talked about. What we did is we more explicitly looked at the, the perch in the whitefish, the two main fish populations. We have the young of year, then the, um, the year plus, two-year-old, three-year-old, where it's a four, four, and four-year-old, four-year-old and older fish. So we added population stage structure to these species. So the, this is the white fish. You, you, we not only have feeding interactions, we have maturation. After a year, the, um, whatever is in this node gets moved to that node and so on. So we have a multiplex network, go, uh, a classic sort of hot area in uh, complexity uh, sciences involved here. Here's the, um, the perch maturation links Here's the full web where we have the feeding links and those maturation links. And so that comprises the main structure of our model.
Now, what we're able to do is let's just look at the uh, solid lines. We're looking at the whitefish here. Before fishing, we fished for about 100 years or so, uh, um, and then this is the la later years, and we have this oscillation fairly, uh, it happens in mainly because of the stage structure in these populations, that you have this year-to-year -year variability. Then we kick in fishing at the empirically observed fishing rate in the lake, and boom, you knock down the, f you reduce the abundance of the fish as seen, and also the variability of these fish in increase. Then when you stop fishing after about 50 years, the, the popul these white fish recover. Now the red line is with those, that's uh, body size selection and maturation <laughs> added to the model. What happens when fish get smaller? They get become more metabolically active. They lose more of their energy to their maintenance. The longer the fishing happens, the smaller those organisms get, and the more drastic that effect happens. And when you stop fishing, you're stuck with these small orga organisms that basically are burning up a lot of energy. They are not as efficiently accruing biomass compared to their larger versions of themselves that would have been their head fishing, not inflicted that selective pressure on them. So there's an extra 10 to 12% 12, uh, 12 decrease in the abundance of these fish due to that um, life history change, and they fail to recover. This is the newborn. What happens with the newborn, they get hugely more, the fishing greatly increases their fluctuation, and thank you, um, uh, greatly increases their fluctuation, and they actually get more abundance due to fishing. These young, these small fishes are pushing, putting a lot of their energy into reproduction. And so that's that effect. If we look at the whole ecosystem, we see the whole ecosystem biomass, we see a increase in fluctuations of all those species, the whole ecosystem. And even after you stopped fishing, that, the, that increased variability remains. So there's some explanation, there's some prediction in there. That's pretty much where we're at with a lot of fishing. We're in cruising, dealing with environmental noise, that sort of thing. So some of the lessons, I think we've established the equations and parameters, including uh, that deal with life history structure and exploitation, uh, uh, including the evolution of uh, evolution of life history uh, on these organisms. Um, we found that the life history effects reduce the robustness and the resilience of these systems. Um, it, it destabilizes the whole ecosystem. And I think it's a promising approach to forecasting fisheries. So this sort of gets at a mechanistic foundation, I think, for sustainability science. We've got, uh, there's a I haven't told you, of course, about all our research, but basically we've got this idea of multiplex ecological networks that deal with the interactions that are happening out there between humans and uh, other species and among species. It's based on this idea of consumer resource interactions. The key parameters are provided by metabolic theory, and it explains and predicts ecosystem services. So. This is our approach to simplifying ecological complexity and generating new understanding. I think we've been able to predict what hasn't been predicted um, uh, before. And I think this has a possibility of, uh, of contributing to a more sustainable, just, and verdant world. If we can understand our effects on the ecosystems with a more precisely predictive way, I think we can allocate our effort, change the way we interact with nature to get more of what we want and do less of the damage that we're doing. Basically gets at a balance of nature. So um, one of the things I want, want to con finally conclude with is that we found that making those webs bigger, increasing the complexity, we've actually increases the ability to predict. Um, the idea, it, it, that's, I haven't shown you, but it's, uh, but it reduces, we can reduce the complexity we see in nature to make it more predictable. And I think it's a wonderful example of, or a good example of applying network science to 
uh, complexity in, in general and complexity of ecological systems in specific. So thank you so much. I hope you have some questions. Do we have questions? Oh, a micro is running to you. Just this is what was left. R removing that species, this is what was, it, basically half the species went extinct in this network. So that was a big interaction strength. Yes. <coughs> yeah, so if we think of all possible ecological interactions across all species, then the ones we've had a nice observation on in these food webs is probably a set of measure zero, uh, right? So um, what's the suggestion about, uh, I mean, it's really nice to be able to make a prediction, but those predictions are very data hungry, meaning you, know, you need uh, some good set of observations, detailed, et cetera, et cetera. There's no way on earth unless everybody on the planet turns themselves into an ecologist, and even then it wouldn't be enough to make a detailed study of all the possible, let's call it, ecological interactions. So do you have any suggestions uh, about how to uh, make things more efficient? Yes, I think this whole, basically this whole talk is about the efficient way to do exactly that. First of all, um, the, the, the underlying theory, uh, operating hypothesis, is the most important interaction is energy. Where do, we, where do organisms get their energy? Where does it go to? Those interactions are um, the most important. Add the rest of them, go ahead, let's go. We, and we are doing that, um, especially where we, we fail. We, I mean, I don't inter, we don't add interactions for the sake of inter, adding interactions. We add interactions when we need to match the data. If we don't, if we do a good match of the data, bingo, I think it says, Yes, there's a zillion interactions. You can ignore them, because at least for the purposes that were said. Now, as far as the parameters, they're fairly easy. Body size, um, often respiration, people measure it. So a lot of these parameters are not only measurable, they're measured many, many times. And in the Lake Constance uh, thing, for instance, if you just measure bacterial metabolism, by body size, you estimate their metabolic rate by an order of magnitude or two. And I didn't tell you that, that but I, we corrected for that to get the match that we did. So there's some of the more detailed empirical effort that you um, mentioned, but I think by and large, this is, from my perspective, this is the best we got. This is the most bang for the buck in terms of understanding and predicting ecological systems as we get i'm sure better ways will emerge that will be a better solution but this is where we're at now another question please oh, yeah. yay i read something you were saying about the resemblance of these models to real real life but also you were saying about the challenges that come from these simulations to the conventional wisdom. Ah. And, my, and, and my question is, how come that? Because your models are coming from real data. So how come that when you do these simulations, you might not find what conventional wisdom has been fi finding in traditional experimental knowledge, for example? Uh, I think uh, the uh, ecology, a tradition in ecology that is difficult for more theoretical like people like myself to deal with are the challenges that everything matters. So um, that uh, things are so, uh, sorry, you change the parameter a tiny little bit, you get a radically different result. Especially when you look at two and three species systems, that they are very sensitive to parameters. Once you scale up to many species, what we find is that those parameters don't, you can mess, you can be 10, 20% off, sometimes an order of magnitude off, and it doesn't make that much different. So that's a huge challenge. I think many people, we get basically toilet trained in ecology with two species systems. Like look how important that uh, intrinsic growth rate is. Um, it's not so important. There's so many checks and balances in these big networks that that very delicate parameter sensitivity is profoundly shifted. 
And I think that's probably the hardest thing for pe more traditionally trained people to get their head around. I think for complexity science in general, and ecologists in specific, I mean, um, the whole definition of chaos, of sensitivity to parameters or initial conditions, like, well, not so much here, which is, yeah, it doesn't, people don't, it, it's going to take a while to deal with that. Everyone wanting some coffee, so if you want to approach Neo outside, you can just get, grab some coffee and talk with him. Thank you. Thank you.